The time has finally come, everyone. Keep it locked and loaded because this is High Caliber. I'm Camille Salazar Hadaway, and I'll be your host for the full reveal. We're about to break it all down, but first, a quick glimpse at what's to come courtesy of Chris Waters and Ubisoft News. All it takes is one look at the new season coming to Rainbow Six Siege to tell you that High Caliber is here to make an impact. Thorn joins the defenders, armed with a dangerous new gadget to send attackers scrambling, and a deadly new weapon to greet them when they do. In addition to the new HUD you're seeing right now, renovations are complete on the Outback map. Plus, player protection updates, balancing changes, and more. It's all coming up right now. Op four, last stop standing. Now I know what you were thinking. What was that weapon in Thorn's hand? How deadly is that gadget? And how exactly does one earn the nickname Thorn? These are all good questions. For the answers, here's game designer Dominic Clement and writer Simon Ducharme. The Thorns gadget is called the Razor Bloom uh, shell. It's a sticky device that can, you can throw pretty much everywhere on the map and it's going to stick on uh, pretty much any surfaces. It's a, it's a, it's a device that once gets, uh, an attacker walks within the, uh, the activation radius uh, will trigger a, a time detonation. During that timer, the attacker will, will be forced to make a decision to either uh, keep pushing, uh, fall back, or, uh, or try to find it and destroy it. We wanted to kind of iterate on the idea of a, of a trap operator, you know, a trap gadget. A lot of the, the gadgets that we have right now uh, that are a trap are, are pretty, uh, I'd say, binary. So either you walk into them and you get the effect or you don't. So with this gadget, we wanted to kind of see uh, what happens if you, you give the players a bit more time to react and you give them a couple options. Imagine you, you have the device that is uh, stuck on the, on the doorway and you're an attacker and you're ready to push the, the doorway and as you, you cross the, the doorway you activate the device. You have really four options that you can really do. The first one is you keep pushing, which is risky because uh, hopefully you, you know that you know, there's no, nobody playing around the gadget to kind of catch you. The second option is to fall back. Obviously you know, you're safe but you've uh, given away your position. And the third option is that if you're fast, you can try to locate it and destroy it before it, uh, it uh, detonates. And the fourth option, which is, uh, well, you accept your fate and you stay there and you take the full damage, which is hopefully not your, uh, your, your best option. With, with the, this, this device, it really creates this, this panic moment, this, uh, this moment where you, you really need to make a, a decision. You hope that it's the right decision. So when it comes to designing the, the look of the device, it's something that, that starts very early in the production of the operator. The device is very uh, mechanical, very engineered, very um, high-tech to get away from something that's maybe a bit more handmade. So Thorn's loadout is quite unique because we're introducing a brand new weapon, the UZKGI. If you don't recognize the name, it's normal because it's completely uh, custom made here announced uh, by, uh, by our team. Uh, it's a small SMG, but don't get fooled by the small size of the weapon because it, it really packs a punch. It's chambered in 50 cal, so it really hits hard. It's a low fire rate, but it can really uh, deal some damage. It will create quite a lot of destruction, and so you can use it to really uh, play vertically and uh, make, make holes in walls. It's, it's really useful in, in that way. The other uh, primary weapon is the M8, M870, which is a shotgun that uh, you can see on operators like uh, Jaeger. In terms of uh, secondary weapon, you have the 1911 Tac Ops, and uh, she also has the C75 Auto. In terms of secondary gadget, she has the shield and a barbed wire. Uh, the shield is actually something that was uh, recommended by us uh, from uh, pool players during a pool workshop. Uh, they felt it was very good to synergize with the, with the gadget of the operator, and uh, we agreed and we, we kept it, and uh, it's, it's a very useful uh, tool. And uh, barbed wires are very useful to slow down uh, the enemy, uh, so if they get caught in the device, in their barbed wire, they're going to have a hard time uh, walking away from it. Thorn is going to be mainly playing as an anchor. She's very useful, uh, close to choke points. You want to have Thorn uh, playing around her gadget because that's where she's the most uh, deadly. Uh, and she's going to be super useful to slow down the attack. Where Thorn shines is where, where you, you play with your gadget. 
when they trigger it, they're going to be panicking. They're going to be running away, running forward. So it's the, it's the ideal moment to really utilize this, uh, this confusion and this panic. What works really well with Thorn is uh, operators like Clash, and Lucy, uh, Legion, these types of operators that really help you slow down the attackers. Clash can actually you know, bait the attackers into the device and then use our electric uh, shock to, to slow down the attackers and kind of get them stuck into uh, the, the danger zone. The main counters for Thorns is your classic uh, anti-utility operators. So you have uh, Thatcher, and you also have Twitch and uh, Zero, which can use their cameras and drones to locate the device and destroy it with their lasers. IQ, obviously, super useful to spot the device and tell your teammates that, oh, there's, there's a Razor Bloom shell uh, on that doorway or in that, uh, in that area of the map. You can also counter the Razor Bloom shell with uh, explosives, so you, you can blow the, the Razor Bloom shell up, you can uh, shoot them, and if you're very courageous, you can also melee it, but I don't recommend this option. <laughs> Thorne's real name is Brianna Skian. She's from a part of, of Ireland uh, that's known for horse breeding and military training. Uh, growing up on her family's farm, she learned the value of hard work and determination because uh, she always had to outperform her four older brothers who never made anything easy for her. And uh, the first ch chance that she got, she uh, followed the horses and joined the Garda. So Thorne is an elite tactical specialist and a weapons expert. She's also the newest recruit to Kavera's team. She's worked with horses, been in mounted police during her police work, and her specialty is actually emergency response. She's uh, always the first to wake up. She's always working out. She loves to challenge herself, and that's why she's so jacked. She actually redesigned her unit's obstacle course because she thought it was too easy. So Thorne is a sort of uh, anti-bully figure, I would say. Uh, she doesn't take any nonsense from anyone, not from her brothers when she was little, not in her work today. And she really operates with the mindset that if you mess with her, you're going to get hurt. Oh, my turn. Thorn's name and Thorn's gadget, the Razor Bloom Shell, uh, kind of come hand in hand with the same concept. Um, Mira actually designed the Razor Bloom after getting to know Thorn. Uh, because she always talks about stories of her, uh, of her brothers trying to take stuff from her and her fighting back. If you try to take things that aren't yours, she's going to fight back and sometimes with sharp things. We located a bomb. High Caliber is taking us back to the Outback. And Jeremy Dousa is here to talk about the map rework in detail. As long as they didn't remove the shark, it's fine by me. Outback's a relatively new map. There were, there were problems with it, despite, you know, doing our due diligence. You know, people found it hard to navigate. Anchoring on, on the sites was actually quite hard. And we want the map to go into Pro League, into Ranked, and we want it to be competitive. So we decided to go through and actually look at the problems, you know, talk to the pro players and talk to the community and see what they think the problems are and how we can address them. It's Outback version two. It's much, much better. It's a lot more fun to play now. The outside was a little bit cluttered and people seemed to have a problem orientating themselves towards where the, where the bomb site was when, you know, once you've droned and actually found it. So we've gone through and addressed those issues, cleaned up the map, cleaned up the outside a little bit and made sure the navigation and flow on the inside is actually much cleaner. Sam and Maddie worked really hard on the garage because it was a less picked bomb site for office and it was always a choke point. It was never fun to play and you always end up playing really off site. So all of the changes, making it smaller and changing the windows, adding cover and just making that area much cleaner has helped the map massively. Pie room and office is now much easier to defend. We've added an exterior breakable wall and office supply, which really aids the ebb and flow of the attack and defense on that site. There was a major change in the restaurant where we've split the rooms into two between Shark, which actually aids the navigation and flow because it's easier. It was a large open area and, you know, making it a little bit smaller, a bit more comfortable has actually made it an awful lot more fun and a lot more fun to navigate in, especially if you're attacking. Obviously in the original map, open terrace was open and it was exterior. Now it's interior and it actually connects piano and resto. So what you've got now is when you come up the stairs towards terrace where it used to be, obviously it's enclosed, there's a double door that's barricaded, and it makes for an interesting 
way to enter the building, especially if you need to get upstairs onto the second floor. But it's also an awful lot more fun because you, know, you hide your drone in terrace and you can get a few like sneaky lines of sight and you can see where people are setting up their defenses. So now it's actually a massive improvement to that area. So the motel rooms have been cleaned up. There was a lot of props, so it's actually been cleaned up. The closet's moved and the bathroom is also an awful lot cleaner now. It was a little bit messy and it was hard to see. It's a much simpler layout now. So Dorm's Laundry has gone to Laundry Piano. Even though it's a relatively small change, you know, it hasn't moved massively. It means it's easier to defend. The roamers have an easier time because it's easier to navigate for the flow. So it's actually made the site an awful lot more fun. There's always a few choke points into that thing and people will just anchor in the corner and you know, just spray the walls. So cleaning it up and actually moving the site has improved that area massively. With the windows being moved, tweaked, and we have removed quite a few windows from the map, it actually is an awful lot more comfortable. You can anchor on the bomb sites. You can roam much easier as well. Going through and fixing these problems one by one by one, and as the map gets better and better and better, the play sessions get more and more fun. That's always the best thing to see is when everyone's having fun, because if we're having fun, I know the community's gonna have fun. Next up, we're checking in with David Perpignan from Ubisoft Barcelona to talk about some balancing updates, including impactful changes to Finca's adrenal surge. Currently, we have a wide variety of both cameras and drones in the fence, and each one behaves a bit different when it comes to being outside of the building. So, for example, drones will disconnect and the cameras will stay connected. What are the main changes? We've defined uh, the same set of rules for drones and cameras. Uh, this means that if drones get outside of the building, they will lose its connection after a few seconds and cameras will behave in the same way. Um, this is affecting black eyes, uh, bulletproof camera, and also maestro heavy lights. So with these changes, we're expecting uh, Valkyrie to get a bit stronger when she's inside uh, the building, because she will waste uh, less cameras outside, more presence of cameras inside, and we also expecting the frustration to be reduced for attackers when facing her, specifically in those maps where approaching the building is already, uh, already a challenge. We also have a secondary issue uh, that is related to Zeros, Argus cameras and Valkyries. Uh, currently, it takes a lot of time to get access to the camera uh, right after deployment, and this is something that we want to fix. What we're doing is that we're allowing players to connect to their cameras even before they finish the, the deployment, which means that you can be holding on the camera with a connecting screen, and when the deployment is finished, you have instant access to the, to the camera feed. In the current implementation, uh, Finca can uh, help other teammates to stand up from down, but not out, but she cannot uh, help herself. So we think this is something that we need to change. The, if she has available charges, uh, she can trigger the ability and she will stand up. Okay, how many of you have filed a report on R6 Fix? Played the test server? If you have, your contributions have been invaluable to the team and there are some big improvements coming. For more, here's test server associate producer, Deanna Stanley. So the current system of R6 Fix, it's a bug reporting platform. Players can go on and they can report issues from either the test server before season launches or for the live game. They just enter a bug with a description and their specs and the dev team will look at it once it's acknowledged. Currently we have some issues with the platform. So we know it doesn't always look active and we hear from users that there's not a lot of trust in the platform right now. There's a lot of search issues, there's problems with ticket management, duplicates, and there's a general lack of clarity on how the platform works. So with R6 Fix 2.0, we have a complete overhaul to the design, we have a better overall user experience, and we have a new severity system to start. So normally users who enter issues are the ones who decide and classify how severe an issue is, but now every contributor to the issue will have a say in that as well. And we've made it easier to submit issues and easier to throw your weight behind existing issues. So if you're spending your time to support the development of Siege by playing on the test server, we want to make sure that that time is respected. 
It's also why we added the possibility for our devs to discuss with players directly in the comment section of their tickets. So it's going to give them better visibility. They'll be able to receive updates on how the fixes are going. We also made it easier for users to search for issues, so it'll be easier to avoid duplicates, for example. We have added a notification system, so users will be able to track any updates to their tickets as well as resolutions. And we hope that this will encourage players to use this as having this central hub is the fastest way that we can address an issue. So good news for console players, R6 Fix 2.0 is mobile friendly, so we want to make sure it's more accessible to our console players since their feedback is just as important to us. It's going to make it more accessible. They can upload photos directly from their phone. And overall, it should be a better experience for our console users. This is definitely the best way to reach out to our devs. It's why we opened this direct line of communication. We want to encourage people to use this uh, channel. It's the fastest way, for sure, for us to see an issue. We're altering the structure of the test servers a little. We know that different players come to the test server for different reasons. Just because you're coming to check out a new operator, it doesn't necessarily mean you want to try out content that's still in the early development stages. So now content's going to be split into more focused testing periods. First, we have our season reveal. The day after the season reveal, we're going to put our seasonal content on the test server. That's going to be only content that's releasing with the season. After that, the season will launch, and the next up will be our new lab test server. So this is going to be more experimental features, giving players a sneak peek at something still in early development. Will this lab test server take place every season? We don't know. We usually have content that's ready to show at that stage, and we hope that we're going to be able to do it as often as possible to give players that sneak peek. Finally, we'll update with the balancing test server, and then leading up to the next season reveal once again. It's no secret that player feedback is really important to us on the test server and on the live servers. It's why we chose to invest in our 6 Fix 2.0 and also why we've brought these changes to the test server. We want to build back that trust with the community and we want to give back more to the community for their help. So we're looking forward to introducing rewards in year seven. This is going to provide content that's going to carry over to the live servers and we're looking forward to sharing more on this next season. When you hear the Siege team use the phrase quality of life, what comes to mind? For high caliber, it means a HUD that's more accessible and contains more information. And it means better player protections, whether you're live streaming or just playing with your squad. Maxime Daigle and Anne-Sophie Pelletier are here to tell you more. The current HUD has a few issues, one of which is that the game has changed uh, a lot in the past few years. Unfortunately, the HUD remained pretty much the same. We've also looked at the future operators and the ambitions of the team, and there's a real need for a reshuffle of information we're showing. You might not know this, but uh, Siege's UI is based on Flash. And uh, internally, we uh, created a new tool called Phoenix. Basically, is faster, it's easier to work with, more future-proof. It's the perfect time for a rework of the HUD. And now, at a glance, you can get a quick impression of what your um, inventory is consisted of. You don't have to switch to your gadget, say, to see if you uh, have a, a certain ammo type equipped. For example, Zofia or Capital. We've also streamlined the way we represent uh, resources, for example, Cavera and Warden. It's a bar that depletes and refills over time. Uh, they're shown similarly in the HUD. We also separated uh, cooldowns from resources. For example, Clash has both. She has a resource bar for her electricity, but also the cooldown in between the shots that can, she can fire. We uh, removed all the text in favor of icons, so we're way more specific in the icons. So if you're deploying an ADS, now the icon will show an ADS being deployed. If you're picking up a frost mat, that's the icon you will see. Last but definitely not least is the compass. It's now central to the HUD. Now the compass for whatever's in front of you is divided into three parts. You have what's above you, what's on the same level as you are, and what's under you. We've also added a ton of new world markers into the compass. So before you only had the yellow pings, but now you have the marked positions, you have the objective markers, uh, you also have the player death markers. We've also added a new module called the ping uh, location reminder. It'll show the floor and the location of the ping so you can make better callouts. We've added a ton of new customization options. 
Uh, I suggest that you visit the new options menu. We've added a new tab for the HUD, and uh, from there you can customize uh, your HUD more than ever. And we're looking into ever adding uh, more options, so eventually scaling and maybe move things around. Terror protection is our top priority, so we want to do it well. Uh, this is why we're taking, we were taking our time with this feature. Our content creators are extremely important for the success of Rainbow. So we are in discussion with them to make sure that we are offering something that is tailored to their needs. Uh, however, we want to protect all players. So we will allow everyone to use an alter ego in the game. Uh, that they can change in between matches so that they can have more, more privacy. Paired with a bunch of, uh, of new settings that coming with them, we are hoping to alleviate the risk of being targeted negatively in game. At first, we will release the feature to a, a small pool of content creators. Uh, we will stress test the feature, make sure that there's no bugs, make sure there's no exploit, and once we're ready, we'll release it to the rest of the population. We realize that there is also a broader need of security at the account level for our players. So we reached out to our colleagues in charge of uh, account at Ubisoft and we are in discussion with them to provide broader security settings for our players. We are extremely excited to let our players try the new privacy settings in the near future. We're moving away from the static team colors. So from now on, in the accessibility tab, you can customize them, meaning that if you want to set your allies team to be red, and if you want to set your enemies team to be orange, you can do so now. We know that the color selection for now is not so great for our colorblind, colorblind players, but we're willing to make this compromise for now, knowing that we're going to be adding a ton of new color options in the future. Gadgets in the world are eventually going to be showing the alliance. What that means is if we're throwing a C4, the light on the C4 will reflect if it's an enemy or an allied gadget. Um, we're looking at the claymore currently and also the barbed wire. Eventually, we're looking at adding more and more game objects that will reflect the colors that you chose in the accessibility options. At the Crystal Guard reveal, you met production coordinator Matt Daigle, who introduced you to the first stage of Elite Skin Customization. Well, he's back, and he's got some good news. Hey, it's me again. Firstly, thank you so much for all your Elite 2.0 combinations. It's been a blast watching social media explode with all the awesome and unique creations. So as we teased in the previous season with customizable headgears and uniforms, I'm excited to announce that this season we're fully ready to release the Elite 2.0 complete package. You'll be able to customize between your ability skins, your victory dances, and your customizable op cards. I'm also excited to announce that we'll be releasing a brand new MTX category, the Exotic Weapon Skins. The animated weapon skins will arrive for Season 4. Here's a sneak peek of what it will look like. Our new Exotic MTX category will open the door to tons of brand new possibilities in the future. The show is almost over, which means it's time to tell you when the test server is going live. It's tomorrow. It's usually the day after these reveals. You know how it works. In addition to the updates we've talked about thus far, the high caliber test server will also include the bulletproof camera rework and the HUD drone counter. These changes debuted in year six season two test server and they are scheduled to go live this season. Experience all these exciting changes for yourself in the high caliber test server starting tomorrow. <laughs>